Welcome to the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Wami Clark. We stand together and accept we now live in a world transformed by the nuclear industry. We expose and confront the intentional neglect and disregard for life on our planet by atomic energy. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action to save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Every voice matters. Our actions matter. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good afternoon. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Thank you for joining our podcast. And I am delighted to have with us Mr. Bruce Gagnon, who is, uh, I think, a director of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. His website is much easier to say, and that is simple, spaceforpeace.org. So, uh, Bruce, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, so I guess most of the listeners that listen to my show or follow my YouTube channel understand that um, my big focus is about the vision for 2020 and uh, really getting the word out that our government, the United States government, plans on taking over our atmosphere and having literally nuclear, not just nuclear weapons in space, but they plan on developing nuclear industry in space. Am I correct on that? Yeah, they see it as a new market. In fact, every year for many, many years, the nuclear industry has an annual conference where they bring together space people, military people, corporate, you know, people from all the various uh, corporations that are working on space technology, and they promote this idea of this new market in space with nuclear power. You know, on my YouTube channel, uh, Carl Grossman gave me permission to read his book. Actually, it's not on YouTube. It's on my podcast. It was one of my first podcasts I did when I started independently producing my show, The Age of Fission, on Spreaker, and I read Weapons for Space on there. And that is where the, he, it's a small book, but it discusses the vision for 2020. Um, it, if people read that book, they would be dumbfounded at how well that plan is going off without a hitch if we look at what's going around the world. Um, yeah. Uh, mistakenly, many people say, oh, you know, space stuff, that day, you know, oh, that's not going to, you know, that's far away if it ever happens at all. But uh, they don't really understand that this stuff is very advanced. And I must say, I think one of the most important things is that the weapons industry, the aerospace industry that is pushing all of this have said that Moving the arms race and nuclear devices into space will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth. Not only the largest, but the most expensive. I call it pyramids to the heavens. The aerospace industry wow. are the pharaohs of our age, uh, and we, the, the people, will be the slaves building the pyramids for these pharaohs. Some years ago in one of the industry publications called Space News, they had an editorial and they said, look, we've got to be responsible corporate citizens. We have to come up with a dedicated funding source to pay for all of this in space. And we have. And we're now sending our lobbyists to Washington to secure that dedicated funding source. So what is it? They said it's the entitlement programs that in America officially are. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the so-called uh, social safety net, which is in tatters today. So these are the programs. If you put your ear to the railroad tracks, as the Native Americans used to say, hear the train coming. These are the programs that are being attacked relentlessly in Washington today. Hmm. It Well, it's because they cannot have, you know, the whole idea is to have complete control over the entire atmosphere. 
Like that's this is why they're demonizing Russia and China because they're large nations who want to have autonomy in the United. I mean, literally, it's it, it's kind of shocking for like for me as an American. I have not been an anti nuke activist. In fact, I don't call myself an anti nuke activist. I call myself a nuke truther because I don't want to be anti anything. But I I only came into this a year after Fukushima blew up. I had a nightmare and. I started uh, kind of by accident doing a radio podcast on a small channel called UCY TV, and then they closed down, and I decided to continue doing it. But in all these reasons, since I started 2014, the overwhelming thing that I've seen is there's kind of shocking. For me, the one thing I've realized is like the so-called peace movement is not interested in the nuclear is not interested really they they're not very interested in stopping nuclear development they have bought into the lies that maybe we could use some nuclear you know energy for for energy uses and to me i think all things nuclear needs to be shut down but you know it looks like we're going you know we're coming up against the hardest the largest industry ever to be developed on the planet and they're pretty suicidal. I mean, I read Alvin Weinberg's uh, statement to a group of space experts. That was, I think it was 1952, and it was only released in 2010, where it was the first time he used that uh, phrase, the nuclear priesthood. And they are very committed to, at all costs, develop weapons in space. Well, first, I wouldn't entirely agree with your statement that the peace community doesn't uh, care about or work much on nukes uh, or nuclear, you know, issues. I, I don't uh, see it that way. I think there are. A lot, I know a lot of people across the country that do and around the world in the peace movement that are very concerned about that. But frankly, the peace movement today is extremely weak. Yeah, uh, I think it. I think it's uh, partly a condition of being overwhelmed. Uh, there's so many fronts we are being attacked on today by the corporate oligarchy that runs our government, mm -hmm. the corporate oligarchies, I should say. Uh, so that's number one. People are just, you know, overwhelmed. Uh, they're aging. The peace movement is an older uh, movement. Uh, a lot of the key people are dying off or slowing down because of age. And also there's a general despair across the society, really on every issue, uh, almost a depression. I'll never forget Helen Caldicott uh, from Australia, the doctor, longtime anti-nuclear activist, uh, has said that the massive numbers of Americans are on antidepressants because mm -hmm. they're so depressed about the condition of the world. Uh, and uh, and I also think that people have made a mistake thinking that it's wrong to be angry. In fact, again, Helen Caldicott says if you're not angry, you're not healthy, because anger is a mm -hmm. a positive reaction to the madness that surrounds us. So a lot of people have bought into this thing. Well, you're not allowed to be angry or show anger. You know, uh, yes, you have to target your anger. You have to control it. You have to direct it. Uh, but Anger can be a positive force for uh, for organizing and change if we use it properly. Well, I think you're right, and I will take your criticism about my statement, the sweeping statement that they don't care, but I think that speaks to my own anger because I was one of those Americans that thought that, you know, I was never active. I was just a single mom taking care of two kids in L.A. I never got actively engaged in anything. I was a D Democrat that voted D, 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 if it was a black person or a person of color, they got my vote first, or a woman. They, like, I knew nothing until 2000, and then I started paying attention because it was such a shakedown. And then Fukushima happened, and that just bolted me into first gear. But I will tell you this, like, one of the things, like, in my intro, uh, I actually do say happiness is resistance, because our oppressors want us miserable because miserable people are un, are easy to control and you know the media owns i mean the 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 industrial military complex basically controls the worldwide media this is why people like you never get on msnbc or fox news 
to say, hey, you know what? We need to cut out the industrial military complex's budget. Like, what? Let me ask you this question. Do you think that that missing $20 trillion that the Pentagon says they can't find, do you think that's part of the weapons in space program? Do you think that's where it's missing too? Uh, It could be. Uh, I think, though, I would answer the question by saying that I think most of the money was just stolen uh, and wasted. I've heard so many times stories about executives working in these weapons corporations that are fully funded with U.S. taxpayer dollars. They each get a credit card, and there's no oversight of what they're using that credit card for. Uh, So I think just uh, legions of money uh, are lost that way. But don't forget that during the height of the Iraq War, after uh, George W. Bush's shock and awe in 2003, the United States shipped over pallets and pallets of shrink-wrapped money that they handed out like crazy uh-huh. to Iraqi people because they thinking that if we buy them off, they won't fight us. They'll submit to us. And how many of those officers stuffed their uh, duffel bags with that money and came back and bought themselves a new house and a new big truck and everything else? I'm sure it happened. So there are many ways that this money gets stolen. But indeed, there is a thing called the black budget, the secret Pentagon budget that is used to fund this high-tech space technology. Not even the Congress is allowed to know how much money is in that black budget, how it's used, where it's spent. And so, indeed, there is all kinds of theft and graft going on. I mean, we're spending a trillion dollars a year on the military in the United States when you add up all the various pots of gold. The nuclear weapons, for example, are not in the Pentagon budget. Right. They're, in the, they're in the Department of Energy budget. So, That doesn't get recorded when we look at the Pentagon uh, spending. So there's all kinds of examples of that. And actually, in the Department of Energy budget, nuclear occupies most of that budget. That's the weird part. It is the most expensive part, and it is the least effective energy that we have, and yet our government continues. I mean, this is where, when I read Weapons for in Space, really... It connected all the dots as to why are we doing this insanity, pouring all this money into nuclear. They have bigger plans than just uh, heating up water to give us energy. This is part of a whole... One of the things that really dumbfounds me is the nuclear, what I call the nuclear denial. Like, people are... you, You can't actually talk to your doctor about maybe being affected by nuclear harm my own sister recently was diagnosed with cancer and lives less than 20 miles away from San Onofre. And when I mentioned it might have been caused from the ongoing leaks up there, the whole family was very upset with me and nobody wanted to talk to me for a couple of weeks. So, oh, God. I mean... And you probably are, are correct. I, I'm, 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 I'm almost certain of it. I mean, the reality is, it, it is, but it's stunning. And so... The idea that, you know, Libby Halevi said this to me, we are really up against the few of us that are willing to speak about this. We have a very big mountain to climb because it has developed because of the nuclear denial, because there's a complete blanket silence about the harm and the that nuclear causes to our entire planet. That's separate and alone from the weapons in space that... We haven't even seen, you know, they're not even, they haven't even told us about that program. One, I mean, the whole idea that Trump invented the idea for the Space Force is laughable because they just had him utter those words, you know. Um, and as far as the presidential candidates speaking out against the Pentagon, I only hear two, and that is Tulsi Gabbard and uh, Bernie Sanders, you know. Bernie Sanders was vilified for saying we have to roll back the Pentagon. Do you yeah, think that's... do you think that there's any like you've been doing this how long have you been engaged in your uh, or with your organization? Why don't you speak about your organization a little bit and, instead of me going on about my opinions? Why don't you tell us a little bit about your organization and how long you've been engaged in this because your historical history might give us some insight on ways we can crack through the bubble. Well, first of all, I want to say this. There was an old black man. I lived in Florida for 30 years before I moved to Maine. 
I've been here now uh, 16 years. And I was an activist in Florida. And there was an old black man at a conference I went to one time that talked about a word called stick to And that is essentially my, uh, my uh, code that I live by. You know, I've been doing this kind of work for a long, long time now. And I've seen that most people come and go. Most people have about a two or three year cycle. They stay about that long and then they move on. Every, we live in the American fast food consumer culture where everybody wants everything right now. I want change now. I want drive up window change. I want to, you know, if it doesn't happen, I'm moving on to another issue. Whatever's hot, I'll jump on that. And, you got to have stick to itiveness if you really, really want to have any success. Uh, go back to June 12, 1982. I'm living in Orlando, Florida. I'm watching C-SPAN, and there's a anti-nuclear weapons protest in New York City at the United Nations, the special session on disarmament, and there were almost a million people there. So I'm watching on C-SPAN the coverage of the rally where the, you know, the speakers and the music. And after it was over, they switched on C-SPAN to a right-wing conference. And the speaker at that conference was Ronald Reagan's head of Star Wars, SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. His name was Lieutenant General Daniel Graham. And during the Q&A after his speech, somebody says, General Graham, they say there's almost a million people in New York today protesting against nuclear weapons. Aren't you worried about that? He said, no, I think it's fantastic. They're out there uh, protesting against nuclear weapons, and we're moving into space. They don't have a clue. Let them keep doing what they're doing. So <laughs> I only let... I only lived an hour away from the Space Center, the Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral in Florida. And so I immediately began working on that. The next year in 1983, we created the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice, which I coordinated for 15 years. And in that job, uh, we did regular protests at the Space Center. And we started looking around the country for allies. And we found a group in Colorado Springs where the Space Command is headquartered. Uh, Citizens for Peace and Space, the local group is called. So we started working together. We got to know Carl Grossman, the journalist from New York. And the three of us put our heads together in 1992 and created the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space because we saw this thing was getting bigger. We needed It was going international. We needed to go international with our protest. And so I began coordinating both groups simultaneously, the Florida Coalition and the Global Network, until uh, around 1999 when I left the Florida Coalition so I could work full-time on space. And I began then traveling all over the U.S. and all over the world, going to places where, come to find out, there were local peace groups opposing the U.S. space program. Why? Because as satellites, U.S. military satellites, orbit the Earth, they send images and messages in real time, split-second time, down to the Earth below them to what are called downlink stations. So in northern England, out in the bush country of Australia, in Greenland, up in northern uh, Norway and Sweden, all over the world, the U.S. has these bases, these ground link stations that bounce the signal from satellite to satellite back to the Earth in real time, split second time. And people have been organizing for many years saying, we don't want our country to be used as a base for the U.S. Star Wars program. So this became the constituency, if you will, the membership of the global network. And we've been doing it ever since. Hmm. This is really amazing. This is the thing that I learned when I first got involved, because when I first got involved, I thought there were not very many people who were anti-nuke activists. What I've discovered is that because of the media blackout of activism against nuclear and nuclear weapons, people it's very difficult to find organizations. And I think this this speaks to why people get burnt out and go away. 
is they just don't think that there's a lot of organizations unless you're actively and locally involved. Then you begin to network. And and frankly, I went through a phase, like you said earlier, uh, I guess it was about a year ago, where I was like, you know what? I've been doing this almost six years now, and we have not been able to get... I go out and protest by myself. I get maybe two or three people to show up. You know, I live in Eugene, Oregon, and I've gone to Portland. I've tried to get people engaged. And there is, it's almost like ga- they're so gaslit or... It, they, to me, they remind me of battered wives, people who just keep defending the batterer and are afraid to go out and speak in public. They are they understand how powerful the nuclear industry is, and they really just don't want to keep pressuring their elected officials because all we get, like I go and regularly meet with my elected officials, Pete DeFazio, Ron Wyden, and Jeff Merkley. They all know me really well. I make appointments. I go into their office. I bring them information and articles. They give me lip service and say thank you very much. And yet all three of them signed a letter encouraging President Obama to develop the small modular reactors. (laughs) All of them. So it's we're, we're engaged in a fight where we are insulated and we have people who will basically just lie to our faces and just to keep us happy and quiet because and I think it's because we're older people they know that we're all going to just die off soon and the young people aren't really paying attention well you know I've, I've been at this for quite a while I was in the Air Force during the Vietnam War that's where I became a peace activist actually during my time in the barracks as it turned out my first roommate was one of the organizers in the GI resistance movement during the war of Vietnam. And he used to organize meetings in my room. And I had grown up in the military. My dad was a career military guy. I joined the Air Force because that's what I knew. That's, you know, that's, uh, I was going to be like my dad. And it was there that my life changed. And so that was 1971. So I've been at this work for quite a while. Wow. And, there's something I've learned, much to my chagrin, much to my sadness over the years, and it's that the public is a little bit lazy, and they want a magic bullet. People are always coming up to me after I speak, and they ask this question routinely. What is the one thing? What is the one thing we can do that will change everything? What if we bought a full-page ad in the New York Times? Would that help? People want the magic bullet, and what they don't want to hear is the bad news that there is no magic bullet, Uh and what it's going to take is hard work and a lifetime, literally a lifetime of dedicated activity. And so I love your expression, the battered wife, because I just used it the other day. I was doing an interview, and we were talking about something similar, and Uh, about the Democrats. Why do people keep going back to the same tired, corporate-controlled Democratic Party, thinking they're going to change it, thinking it's going to come around? And uh, I called it the battered wife syndrome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really, really... uh, let, Let me give you an illustration of the complicity of the Democratic Party. It's not just Ronald Reagan that's pushing the space force. True. In fact, the other day I wrote a blog post about the vote on the NDAA uh, just last week where 188 Democrats Mm -hmm. joined the Republicans in the House of Representatives to push forward the NDAA that was pitiful. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. And in there was money for the Space Force and the authorization Mm -hmm. to create the Space Force. And... Only 44 or 45 Democrats voted against that NDAA. So uh, three times that number voted in favor of it. So that party is complicit Mm -hmm. from top to bottom, with a few noble exceptions, in pushing all of this madness. And what did the Democrats complain about when it came to the Space Force? Only one thing. Only one thing. They wanted to call it the Space Corps rather than the Space Force. That's it. That's all the Democrats had to say. Well, all the the Democrats voted for the Unpatriot Act. 
I mean, like, yeah, that's let's just right. be clear. You know, I mean, I still call Ron Wyden's office and tell him we need to revoke the unpatriot. I don't call it the Patriot Act. I refuse to. Because it is, it is an unpatriot act that took away all of our civil liberties and rights. It's what it's why Snowden is in Russia right now, to be honest. It's shocking. You were completely right about this. I mean, I, you know, I am a, I guess I'm a protest voter for Bernie. I'm going to vote for Bernie Sanders and watch the Democratic Party steal his nomination again because no way, there's no way anyone's going to let him take that nomination at all. That he doesn't have a chance at all. Not, I get it, but I, I am going to just watch them steal it. And then, I've been thinking about this because what what this is what they this is what they rely on and this is how they continue to be manipulate people who call themselves progressives to support the industrial military complex. If you talk about being uh, you know against the military in our country, you're considered unpatriotic. You know, and it is to me an outrage that we are now uh, basically a fascist nation run by these, the industrial military complex that thinks the whole entire world is, it, we're assets, like my, my intro says, you know, we're assets, we're not assets on a balance sheet. But that's... Well, you know, Mussolini's uh, former uh, leader, fascist leader of uh, Italy during World War II, his definition of fascism was the wedding of corporations and government. Mm-hmm. If we don't have that, I, then uh, I'm, I'm dreaming. I'm living in a dream world. Uh, we clearly have a fascist government. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about it. Uh, that's who controls our our government. And we that's have why a fascist culture. Let's just be clear. I mean, people do not object to MSNBC and CNN uh, refusing to cover anything else other than you know the talking points of whatever, whichever party they're prone to. I mean. Disney bought Fox last year. That barely made the news. Disney bought Fox. I mean, it. you know, they're priming our kids. To be honest, I'm self-employed. And I hired a, a, a guy maybe four years ago to work in my office. And he came to my office one afternoon, a young kid, and said, oh, I think I'm going to join the military. And I said, are you kidding? He goes, yeah, that way I could go to college for free when I get out. I said, you know what? You're fired. I'm done. I don't want to have you in my office. I do not. I honestly, my sister's kids are, they, they're in the military. I am, I don't believe in it. And I think that we really need to act on the f- idea that the military is not a good thing and it is harmful to planet Earth as we've seen everywhere. Here in Oregon, we have INEL, which is the Navy base where they have, we talk about Oregon is supposed to be anti-nuclear, but we have nuclear waste dump sites that are on the edge of border of Idaho and Oregon, they have no idea what they're going to do with the nuclear waste down there. None. Zero. It, it's just going to contaminate the planet. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, earlier uh, we were talking about the uh, vision for 2020 and the mm-hmm. space force that's being created. And there's there's three words that... Uh, we're in the vision for 2020, full spectrum dominance. I'd mm-hmm. like to talk about those for a moment. Please do. What that really means is that the United States, the U.S. Space Command, the Pentagon, sees their role under corporate globalization of the world economy. They say at the Pentagon that every country will have a different role. Some countries will make shoes. Other countries will make uh, televisions and uh, cell phones and America's role they say under corporate globalization of the world economy will be security export wow that means endless war on behalf of who on behalf of corporate interests and so this is what full spectrum dominance really translates to that the US must control conflict at every level on the ground with the army the Navy in the sea, the Air Force in the air above the Earth, and then the Space Force in the, in the, in space. And whoever controls all of that, especially whoever controls space, 
sees everything on the earth below, can hear everything on the earth below by intercepting all communications, fax, email, etc., and then can target any place on the earth below. One example is during shock and on 2003 when Bush launched that illegal uh, war on Iraq in the initial attack 70% of the weapons that were used were directed to their targets by military satellites which I now call weapons themselves because they're the triggers for war they war does not happen on the planet unless you have military satellites up there triggering everything mm -hmm. They control all warfare on the planet. So the idea is that the United States must dominate space and deny other countries access to space. That includes Russia and China mm -hmm. so that we can be the master of space. And at the Space Command headquarters building in Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs, above their doorway, they have their logo that reads master of space. Well, this is crazy. And it reminds me, it reminds me eerily of another slogan from World War II that the Nazis used, Deutschland über alles. Hmm. What does that mean? Germany overall. That's kind of the U.S.'s idea here, isn't it? In Weapons for Space, in fact, uh, in the actual Vision for 2020 statement, I think it was written in the early, late, early 70s, Somewhere in my head, I thought it was 1952, but in doing some research for this interview, I think it was like the early 70s. The actual vision for 2020 actually said the United States, and the forward was by the Congress at the time, said that the United States had an, a right to control the atmosphere and all the commercial activity in the atmosphere and outside to the point of Congress endorsing piracy, if any other nation went up there and mined satellite, mined um, any other orb or anything else for minerals, the United States has a right to go and conduct piracy on those nations and take it from them because everything out there is ours. <laughs> I mean, it's and they're deadly serious. They are not joking. They really plan on having absolute control of and in fact they as you say they do right now they control with our satellite weapons that's a really important statement you just made and it's backed up by evidence real hard evidence a book published by the united states congress called military space forces the next 50 years it was actually a congressional study by a staffer by the name of john collins then published as a book in 1989 by the Congress of the United States. What's the name it's of that book? Military Space Forces, The Next 50 Years. Wow. So it's, it's evidence that they have a long-range plan. They're working towards a certain goal. And the Congressional Introduction, as it's called, is signed by the likes of John Glenn, former... Right astronaut, U.S. Senator from Ohio at the time. Bill Nelson, at that time a member of the House of Representatives, went up on the space from Florida, from Cape Canaveral area, went up on the shuttle one time, became a U.S. Senator from Florida. A John Kasich, currently the governor of Ohio, then in the Congress, and a host of other politicians. And in there, they talk about a thing called the Earth-Moon-Gravity Well. They say, think of it like a wishing well. Imagine someone is down at the in the bottom of the well, and you're at the top. They're trying to get out. Well, you have the advantage because of gravity. They have to climb out of that well. You're sitting there at the top. You control their access to getting out. Wow. Well, it's the same. It's the same way with the Earth and the Moon. They say with U.S. Uh, armed satellites on either side of the moon, the United States would be able to control who could get on and off the Earth-Moon gravity well. In other words, they would be able to control the front gate, if you will, on and off the Earth as people try to go out in the future and mine the sky for precious minerals and resources. And they say in this study, this congressional study, quote, armed forces might lie and wait at that location 
to hijack rival shipments upon return. Mm -hmm. And so this means that they are indeed talking about piracy. They understand that there's much money to be made in the future by going out and mining the sky, and they want to have full-spectrum dominance so they can control who gets to make the riches in the years ahead. But there's an obstacle. The obstacle is the United Nations treaties, the Moon Treaty and the mm -hmm. Outer Space Treaty, that say no country, no corporation, no individual can claim ownership of the planetary bodies. They're the province of all humankind. And so the UN very smartly was trying to preempt conflict in the future about the mining space operations. So the U.S. today is working to circumvent that those two treaties. When Obama was president, he signed a bill to allow American corporations to make land claims on planetary bodies in violation of these treaties. Again, this shows that the Democrats are complicit in this process. Oh, yes. And uh, so anyway, uh, now the aerospace industry, the corporations, have been creating space law departments, <coughs> excuse me, at law schools around the world to uh, essentially train a team of lawyers to make sure that this privatization of space is possible in the future. And so they're really out in front of this game uh, many years in advance, and most people don't know anything about it. No, most people really, they think that Donald Trump invented the idea of a space force. <laughs> like, seriously, that's what I mean. Like, I think this is kind of a planned effort. The whole thing, even putting Obama in and then throwing us through a mega loop by allowing Donald Trump to take over the White House. It, Americans are traumatized by this administration at this point. I mean, seriously, Americans are really getting pummeled by a narcissist, a violent domestic abuser. And it, 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 you know, what they're being set up for is not asking questions when Don, like it's the fear-based voting that is going again. You know, the Democrats are planning on a fear-based vote uh, in for the 2020 elections. Like, you know, in my view, I think it's all. To be honest, it's all a part of the, this bigger picture of rolling out the vision for 2020 to make Americans not only comply with the program but to agree with it um Bruce have you ever seen this movie this kids movie it was um oh my gosh it's called uh uh space boy I think it's called the space boy and it's about this little boy that circles the earth in a, in a airplane and Astro Boy, that's the name of it. it you ought to watch it it's a kid movie it's a cartoon movie but it's really it I sat down with a little neighbor boy that I was babysitting about five years ago when I was first, even before I got involved in the whole nuke truther movement and this whole idea of me understanding the bigger picture. This movie literally is about people circling the earth because the earth is so contaminated that people can't live on it. And so this kid's living this pretty comfortable life, and somehow he happens to come down to planet Earth and discovers there's human beings living in squalor and abject poverty down here, and that all of the good assets are going to the people, you know, living up in space. For me, that was like mega programming, uh, pushing the youth into a sense of desperation of there's nothing you're going to get. There's no no... You have absolutely no power to stop this machine. And I think that is partly why, like, for me, one of my big objections, and I sort of, I, I send messages to this young girl, Greta Thunberg, about nuclear contamination all the time because, you know, there's never any conversation about the climate collapse, about how nuclear weapons and nuclear contamination have contributed to the collapse of our environment. Not a single word. It is just completely, absolutely not even just, you know, the Natural Resources Defense, I think it's the Natural Resources Defense Fund out of New York, worked with the legislators in Illinois to keep two leaking nuclear power plants open 
against the wishes of the voters of that state because their goal was to close down coal in Illinois. Yeah, <laughs> you you are so right. You know, I like your uh, political instincts, by the way. I think you you seem to have really good instinct for for the BS that's going on. Um, I want to say something about the uh, climate change movement, uh, the fact that they ignore the military connection. Why yeah. is that? Yeah, exactly. Why is that? Exactly. Uh, why is it that I, I have a friend in uh, Vermont who has a radio show, he used to work for the American Friends Service Committee on peace. They got... Uh, financial problems he got laid off but he, he's had a radio show for a long time and he ch he's tried for years to get bill mckibben to come on his show and talk about the connection between military military and and climate as it turns out the military is the largest industrial polluter institutional polluter on the planet that's right it has the largest carbon boot print on the planet they use more fossil fuel than anybody so if you're trying to really deal with climate change, but refusing to bring in the military connection, what's the reason for that? It makes no sense. And what I've discovered is that it's the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party wants to get back into power. They want to retake the White House. They want to retake the Senate. They have the House now. And they want to ride the climate change movement back into the White House, just the way they did when Obama first ran for president, right after uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the Bush, Bush years. war in Iraq. And Obama rode the anti-war horse mm -hmm. right into the White House. That was one of his major issues. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then after he got elected, he put the horse in the barn, he locked the door, <laughs> he threw the, threw the key in the Potomac River, and we never heard from him again as he went on to create seven wars and had the drone. And pretty quickly, I mean, within a few weeks, he hired all of George Bush's advisors. And nobody nobody in the Democratic Party put up a peep about that. There was no change of regime. I mean, to me, when Obama got elected, that, to, well, there was a, my political evolution in terms of uh, me becoming aware of the fascism that is now engulfed. Our, our so-called democracy. I mean, we we think we have a democracy. We're free to decide which fast food chain we want to go to. And by the way, if you decide you hate fast food chains, you're anti-American. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's stunning the level of brainwashing and gaslighting that's going on. But you know, the unpatriotic well, me... act was rolled out, and then Barack Obama got elected. I felt tremendous relief, and then within a few weeks. You know, none of George Bush's advisors were all his White House advisors. Let me finish this thought, if you don't mind, uh, about the Democrats today. I want to finish this this little screed I'm I'm uh, going on here about the Democrats and climate, how they're now riding the climate change movement. And what I've learned over the years is there are these so-called progressive foundations and big donors mm -hmm. that fund the climate change movement. And as it turns out, they're allied to the Democratic Party. The Democrats don't want to see climate change activists. They don't want to see young college people, the Sunrise Movement, Greta, you know, Greta from Sweden. They don't want to see any of those people talking about the military because then that creates an uncomfortable situation for the Democrats because they support the military industrial complex. They're funded by the military industrial complex. We have a shipyard here in Maine, just a few miles from where I live in the mid coast, uh, in Bath, Maine, where they build destroyers for the Navy. They're outfitted with so called missile defense systems that are part of this Star Wars program. And every time they have a christening of a new ship, giving it the blessings of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, uh, the Republicans and Democrats right. in our congressional delegation are all there on their bended knees, swearing complete and utter allegiance and subservience to the military industrial complex, always begging for more money. And the liberal Democrat congresswoman from our district, who's 
good on all these issues, but and says, oh, but I'm sorry, there's just no money for some of the things we want to do, you know, uh, dealing with student debt and Medicare for all. There's just no money for any of that. Yeah, that's because she's supporting the money for uh, the Pentagon. She just voted. She's one of the 188 Democrats that just voted last week uh, for the NDAA. Okay. For $750 billion more for the military in the next uh, year. So this is the complicity of the Democratic Party. So all of those so-called progressives out there that continually, continually uh, give their money and time and uh, subservience to the Democrats, thinking that they're going to change stuff, sad to say, friends. You know, you do have the right to vote any way you want. It's a sacred trust voting. I, I understand that. But come on, get some analysis here as well, to what's really you know going what, on. Bruce, that actually leads me to my question. And I really I appreciate engaging on this because for me, like I am a, what I call a protest vote with the Democratic Party because I am, a, a, I'm going to, I mean, I was angry at Bernie for, even supporting Hillary Clinton after they basically stole the Ill, not primary from him. And again, it was a fear-based vote because nobody wanted Donald Trump. But, you know, fear, love is greater than fear. We have to give people something to vote for. It is going to happen again. There's going to be a bunch of very angry Bernie voters when we go into the uh, the uh, convention and the super delegates, because there's no clear winner, gives it to Joe Biden or Pete Buttigieg or whoever it is they've decided they're going to give it to. What what do people, where do people go? Who, who I mean, there really is no alternative. I, I personally can't stand Jill Stein. I, I, I can't, I can't abide that for me. So there is really huh. nowhere to go. Why don't you like her? Yeah, fundamentally, you want me to tell you why her husband's a doctor. I don't believe in the American Murder Association. I can't. It's kind of like anybody who goes into the military. Two kinds of people I avoid in my life: cops and doctors, because I don't believe. I think the uh, AMA is fundamentally in like the industrial military complex. It is uh, a, a god that you cannot even doubt. But they may they kill a million people a year, and we what, have. But it what issue do you disagree with Jill Stein on? You know, the thing is with Jill Stein is uh, I just don't trust that she will actually stand for what she says. I just don't. There's something about her. I just The fact that she's married to a doctor makes me not trust her. It's like that kid that I fired when he said he was going to go into the military. Someone who can uh, fraternize with the enemy is not someone I trust. Well... You probably know she's not running for president again. Yes, I know. I do know that. But who who do we have? Who who is there? I mean, who is it? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing. Um, I'm a Green Party member. I voted for Jill Stein twice and was happy to do so because I never saw anything I disagreed with her on, frankly. But the voters of Maine, where I live, uh, two times now have voted in a statewide referendum that we want ranked choice voting for congressional elections. Right. That's right. And we got it. Did and, you really? Yeah, the first time the state government ignored us, but the second time people did it again. They collected the signatures, put it on the ballot. And voters voted for it again, demanding it. Now we got it. So this next election, for example, our U.S. Senate race is ranked choice voting. That means that Susan Collins, a despicable Republican, and the Democrat, who will likely be Sarah Gideon, who's a corporate Democrat, mm -hmm. they both already raised more than $6 million of corporate wow. money. Uh, they're going to have a challenger if we can gather the signatures and get her on the ballot. Who? Who is this? Uh, her name is Lisa Savage. She's a dear, dear friend of mine. She's one of the leaders in the peace movement. She's one of the leaders in the movement making the connection between military and climate. And uh, mm -hmm. so I've been working with her for many, many years. We've been arrested together at Bath Ironworks protesting these uh, warships that are built there. 
And so she's running for the United States Senate as a Green. If she can get 2,000 registered Green signatures in the middle of winter here in Maine between January 1 and March 15th, she'll be on the ballot and people can uh, vote their preference and their, the spoiler effect will no longer be uh, in play in the state of Maine. So this is a wonderful thing for us. A very exciting. So I hear what you're saying is that really, you know, the choice is we can lean into the Green Party. I, I mean, I'm, I am actually, I actually, I actually was a Green Party member, and then I decided in this primary to re-register as a Democrat so I could support Bernie. Really, is kind of a protest vote because I really, uh, I, 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 I like Bernie's policies. I like Bernie. He's the, he, in fact, the one thing I liked about him, he's. He and Tulsi Gabbard are the only two people who talk about reining in the military spending. They're the only two that say, we can't keep feeding this endless war machine. And uh, that's a big issue for me. But here in in Oregon, for example, the Green Party is so weak. People really, it has been demonized so badly. But I, I, mean, I hear you that maybe that is our only option of where to go. Uh, you know, and part of it is really, and I will admit I'm guilty of this myself, there's a lot of political ignorance in terms of how do you move through politics? How how do you know who's better than what? And like with the Green Party, like there's something about Jill Stein that just I don't, don't like her, to be honest. There's a, a unlike, not that I don't agree with her policy, but there's something. And then when I found out she was married to a doctor, I'm like, yeah, that's the that was it for me. But, All right, well, but she's not running. So now yeah. there's a good good guy running from New York State called Howie Hawkins. He's run for governor there as a Green a few times. He's real good. He's uh, got great policies. Look him up. Check him out. Howie he's Hawkins, one, and he's the Green he, Party member, presidential candidate. That's right. And also, I urge people to take a look at uh, Lisa Savage here in Maine. Okay. Lisa for Maine. We've got to raise money uh, nationally uh, to uh, help get her on the ballot and to run her campaign. So uh, okay. people can people can go to her website. I'll Lisa, have the links in the in the podcast notes. Lisa, um, for, Lisa for Main dot org. Okay. Lisa F O R Main, all one word dot org. But she's a wonderful person, a great, great uh, uh, candidate, and a dear friend. Twenty five year school teacher in the poorest county in the state. Uh, uh, worked with Native Americans here in Maine to retire the last mascot at the high school nearest her, the Skowhegan High School. Uh, so she's friends and supporter of native people in the state. Uh, mm-hmm. She's got a wonderful. She used to be a union leader, uh, contract negotiator for her teachers' union. So she's really uh, very experienced and a tremendous, tremendously inspiring person. Uh, the main Green Party is weak, as you said. Uh, similar to yours in Oregon. That's intentional, though, and I get that. That's why I continue to be. Like after the elect, after the primary, I'm going to re-register as a Green Party member. To be honest, because but really, the Lisa thing is, is now Lisa is now rebuilding the Green uh, main, main Green Party. And in fact, I just uh, starting yesterday uh, asked my organization, the Global Network, for a three month unpaid leave of absence, and I'm volunteering to work full time to get Lisa on the ballot. Uh, for the next three months, I'm, I'm not going to have any income coming in. But it's so important to me uh, that we have an alternative to these two damn corporate parties that are ruled by corporate money, oligarch money. And uh, so that's what I'm uh, trying to do. Wow. Well, you know what? We have about, uh, really, we've gone over a little bit, but I can give us a little bit more time, about two more minutes. Bruce, I really appreciate uh, you being with us. You've been listening to Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission with uh, Bruce Gagnon, who is the director of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. His website is space for peace and the number four, space number four peace dot org. Please check out his website online. And I thank you for invigorating me about the Green Party again and maybe finding an alternative because it has been a big issue for me of what do we do now because I really oppose 
fear-based voting. It's why I don't call myself an anti-nuker. I call myself a nuke truther. I don't want to be anything anti. I want us to be for life, for love. And as people who listen to my show know, I really believe that love is greater than fear and happiness is resistance. Like we need to keep ourselves happy because we can't let the oppressors take the one thing that we can control away from us. Right on, Lonnie. Lonnie, I really enjoyed being on your show. Thank you very much for for having me. I uh, And I wish you the best and your listeners the best in the new year. And let me just remind everybody that of that word that that old black man taught me many years ago, stick-to-itiveness. Uh, stick to it. Don't give up. We can't surrender. We can't ever walk away. Because it, look in your eyes of your children, your right. grandchildren, those around you, the children around you, the plants, the animals outside, the future generations, the life around us. That's what we're fighting for. Uh, forget about money. Forget about uh, notoriety. Forget about all this other earthly uh, crap. Uh, let's fight for the future of this beautiful, beautiful planet we live on. That's the most important thing we could do with our own lives. Amen to that. Well, you know what, Bruce? Thank you. And I hope that you'll come back with us in maybe six weeks, eight weeks again, and we can pick this up because this has been really invigorating and I really appreciate it. And um, thank you, everybody who listens to this podcast. Please like, subscribe, and share. This information is important and it really is up to all of us. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bruce, for joining us. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Age of Vision radio show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We'll be back next week to bring you more information about the nuclear industry and the harm it's causing our planet and humanity. Find all of our podcasts on Spreaker.com or on YouTube at Nuts for Art, N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T. Thank you for being part of the solution.